Well, thank you for joining us today for the Maranatha program. Always thankful that you take this time and you worship the Lord with us. We are so thankful that we have the freedom to worship Him. God is so good and I just want to always praise Him. Let me draw your attention to the bottom of the screen. We have a phone number there that you can call during the week, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m to 4.30 p.m. That number's there for you to call with your prayer request. We believe in prayer. The number is 217-423-2452. And we love to pray for people, and we know that we are living in this world. We're not of this world, but until we go to heaven, we'll have problems, won't we? But we have a God who will answer our prayer. So call that number this week. Let's go into the service. God bless. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Well, I know that uh, as your week has progressed, um, there are always things that try to come and, and, and steal your joy or steal your vision. So this morning, I just encourage you that um, you're here, not by accident this morning, that you have set aside this time and this place, and that God will honor that. And so as you begin to look your eyes towards heaven this morning and just focus on him, come let us worship our King. He has done amazing things. How many of you have a testimony that he has done great things in your life? Hallelujah. So we just worship him this morning. So I encourage you to, to worship with us as we uh, give honor and glory to our king this morning.
I'm up here this morning. We are honored this morning to have Mike Livengood uh, here with us and his wife, Linda. Linda is an accomplished singer and, and uh, musician, and she will be singing during the altar call today. But uh, they have traveled over 25 and preached in over 25 nations in the world. He is a uh, founder of Mike Live and Good Ministries in New Zealand. Doorkeepers, New Zealand doorkeepers. Uh, there, uh, Mike had a, he was here to, supposed to be here earlier in the year, uh, and he had a heart attack. So he wasn't able to come, but they're here today. We're honored to have them. Brother Mike, alive and good, would you come up, please? Can we give him a big hand? It's great to be in the house of the Lord today. Talking with Pastor Doug earlier this week, and uh, we go back a long, long way, longer than either one of us probably would like to recognize at this point. And it's a delight and an honor for us to be here. I'm going to take about two minutes to share what we do and the offering that will be received in a few moments, what is going to help us do, and then I'll be back to share the word that we believe the Lord has given us. Uh, preacher's kid who grew up in the state of Illinois. My father was an Assemblies of God pastor. For 10 years, we served as pastors in this state, and then God said, have I got a surprise for you? And he put us into itinerant ministry, and then he threw another curve at us. He said to my wife, are you willing to not see your grandkids if that is what I ask you for? So we made the assumption a lot of people would make at that point because our, our kids were teenagers at that point. And so we're thinking God's getting ready to call one or both of them to the mission field. God said, have I got a surprise? And instead of them being overseas, we suddenly found ourselves with no opportunity to go through the necessary schooling. We just kind of got thrown into the deep end and uh, kind of figured out in, in route and has spent anywhere from six to eight months of every year over the last 25 years outside the borders of the U.S. Uh, we will be going in a few weeks. We will be leaving again in October for the nation of New Zealand, and then we will also be preaching in Taiwan, and we will be in Finland and probably the Philippines all before the year comes to an end. Quick story out of Finland. Uh, we were there last year, and uh, the, the man who put the schedule together had asked us to go speak at a Finnish church. Now, most of what we were doing was international churches, but we'd gone to this Finnish church to preach, and uh, I don't speak Finnish, and they didn't speak English. And so we had an interpreter, a translator, and I had preached the message and when uh, the invitation was given, when I gave the invitation, the entire church responded. Now, this was not a come and get blessed sort of message or invitation. This was, in fact, you don't preach this way the first time you're at a church, but this was very confrontive, very in your face, get right with God, you know, sort of message. And, and the entire church, with one exception, came to the altar. And I'll be honest, I am thinking to myself, the interpreter did not interpret that right. Uh, they, they didn't get this correct. This, they, I should not be getting this type of response. Uh, but I, I knew this. There was a presence that was so thick in that auditorium. It was all I could do, literally, to move. And at one point, I said quietly to the interpreter, either I'm getting owed or there is a presence of God in this place. And she said, you're not getting owed because I sense that presence too. Well, we went out to eat after the service and uh, sat down with the staff. And they didn't speak very much English. What they spoke was, wow, wow, wow. How long are you in Finland? What do we have to do to get you to come back? Now, at that point, I figured something was happening. So we get back to Helsinki, and my host said, what happened this week? And I said, well, I'm not really sure. And I told him what I told you, that I had preached, and there was this response, and I didn't know if they really understood it. And he looked at me and he said, Michael, there's some things I did not tell you before I sent you to preach in that church. What I did not tell you was there had been some huge 
moral failures and sins at the leadership level of that congregation. He said, I have a feeling they understood your message and they understood the altar call quite well. God just used you in that church. That's what we will be doing again. In New Zealand, where a pastor there said, I have never felt conviction from the Holy Spirit come into a room at that level as we felt in the meetings in 2000 when Michael and Linda came to preach. And at the same time, I've never felt the compassion of Jesus Christ. It's what we will be doing when we go to New Zealand to preach. It will be what we will be doing when we're in Taiwan and when we're in Finland. We have the privilege to go and to normally work with our missionaries, although in New Zealand we didn't have missionaries. Uh, we went to do, I, I didn't go to New Zealand to preach. I went to attend a conference and God said, well, I got another surprise for you. And while at that conference, we were invited to speak at a church, and that led to the invitation that opened the doors to that nation. So the offering you're going to receive in a few moments is going to help my wife and I to get on the airplane again, go back to New Zealand, and from there to Taiwan, on to Finland, Philippines, and to have the privilege again of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you for not only helping the hearts, so you are Marty and Brenda Roman's daughter. I knew you looked familiar. Grew up with your mother. Went to Bible college with your father. And when you were really, really little, I hate to say this, man, but we preached for your mom and your dad. Just need to hear you guys this morning. God bless. So we're going to take a love offering this morning. <clears throat> Please. Uh, what I ask of you to do is ask God what you would have, he would have you to give in this offering. These are proven missionary evangelists, and they've won many souls uh, through their ministry. And we need to send them again, right? So uh, if you haven't got any money this morning, get some from your neighbor. They'll give it to you. All right, let's take the offering. Father God, we thank you for uh, these missionary evangelists, Mike and Linda Good. Father, we thank you for the, uh, bringing healing to Mike's body, but we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the souls that have been won in the meetings that they have been in. And Father, we pray continued blessings over their lives. I pray, Father God, that this offering would help meet their need. And uh, Father, we give you thanks for everything you do. You're an awesome God and greatly to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Evangelist, uh, Missionary evangelist, Mike Livengood. Thank you, Dale. Somebody asked, asked from time to time, where do you live? I am very tempted to say to them, somewhere above the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> Have you ever had the experience where you became convinced that the voice of God sounded just like the person you were married to? <laughs> You say, I'm not the only person that's had that moment where God chose to speak to you through your spouse. Well, many years ago, I wrote a little booklet on what happens during revival, and it's kind of a, a discussion biblically, historically, about some of the stuff that can happen in moves of God that's, you know, outside of the box. But then my wife began to speak to me, and really it was the voice of the Lord, and she began to say, you know, you really need to write you know, about something that pastors ask you about and the things that God has used you in. And so this book, The Glory Factor, uh, Adventures in Revival, Stories, the stuff we've seen God do, the, the tangible manifest presence of God, that for me that is the earmark of genuine revival when He comes. And your language does tend to get reduced to very simple words like, wow. And the second book I wrote then, I decided to call the wow factor. And in that book, we specifically say, what is it that attracts that presence of God into places? And I'm not writing from theory. You know, thank God for those who create the theory. But these are going to come from the experiences that God's allowed us to be a part of the privilege he's given us. 
And then my wife began to say to me again, she said, you know, you've written about the spirit side. You've written about that side of the move of God. You need to write about the truth side. So the last book is called The Gospel Factor. It's the preaching that takes place in Moosey God. Linda, I'll give you the books. If you'd be kind enough to stand with me, I'd like to pray and then get right into a few moments. When I was talking with Pastor, he said to me a couple of things. He said, you know, if you just want to tell stories about what you've seen, he said, that would be good. But then he said, but we've just been finishing this series on the book of Acts and, and, the, and the fire of God and the church on fire. And, and I said, that's interesting because for some time now, the Lord has been dealing with me about the subject, uh, the fire. In fact, I was asked to speak at a church that was renaming itself. Uh, they're going to call themselves a church of flame. And, um, and I've said, the Lord said to me, when you speak at that church for their rebranding service, I want you to speak on that subject. So I started a pretty intense study. In fact, I, I, I read every one of the 583 verses of Scripture where the word fire or flame appeared, and I decided there's no way I could preach on all of those. So what I want to do this morning in just a moment is share. I, I, will, I will cut out the first half of the sermon because I think you probably covered that in the last month. And I'm going to move away from the, the, the theory of it and just share with you some stuff we have seen when the fire of God begins to come, both biblically and then we will get some experiential how that which the Scripture says, what that could look like in our lives, our churches, our communities. But would you pray this with me? Heavenly Father, open my heart that I may hear what you would say to me. Change my life. Make me more like Jesus in his precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm always a bit hesitant to share anything that might shift the center of focus away from the Lord or that might place too much emphasis on the messenger rather than the message. But I'm going to take a risk and share just a bit of two prophetic words that I received over 25 years ago that relate to the fire of God. The first occurred in March of 1996 through Steve Hill, the evangelist at the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola. The part that would be relevant was this phrase in the prophetic word that God gave him for me. God is going to use you to start this fire in many places. I didn't really understand what that meant at that point, but to watch the journey that began to follow. It's a promise from God that he wants to start fire in our lives. The second occurred at the close of a 15-week revival that we had the privilege of preaching, where right at 500 people had given their lives to Jesus. I don't think I've ever shared in a public meeting what I'm going to tell you in the next couple of minutes. But at the close of that time, someone approached me, and they had a prophetic word. Again, I think the part that's important for today was this. The Lord said, I'm the one who put the fire in the flame. I'm the one who put the fire to the bush. I'm the one that has ignited you. Trust me. I will ignite fires where I send you. The fires will depend upon what there is to burn. A fire that is seeking or a heart that is seeking will burn with intensity. But those that have not the heart to hear will only smolder. No flame. I am very much aware that when God sends the fire, that is something that only God does. I will tell people that that which I am looking for is something that goes beyond my capacity to produce. If that which takes place is only that which I can create, either by oratorical skills or by some sort of emotional manipulation, then we have failed. But if something comes from God, it will change our lives. It will change our churches. It will change the places that we live in. In 1999, we received an invitation from one of our missionaries, Bill Snyder, to go to the nation of the Philippines to preach a conference for the Assemblies of God. 
Just before we were to go, he called me and said, you need to speak. And he named a certain pastor, said, you need to speak to him because he was just here. And he needs to tell you what it is that you are going to see and prepare you. So I called the pastor in question, and we set a, a time frame that we could talk. And I'm trying to do what my doctor said, drink more water when I preach. And so this pastor began to share with me what they had seen while they were in the Philippines ministering and 10% of the population of a city that they were in had responded to a salvation altar call. His 10-year-old son walking up to people in wheelchairs and grabbing them by the hand in the name of Jesus. And they'd come out of the wheelchair. I was feeling about that point in time rather intimidated. I am thinking to myself, I am going over there next and they are going to expect me to do what he did. So I explained to the Lord, I don't have that type of anointing. That is not the way you normally use me. I've got a great idea, God. Why don't you send him back? He can go over there and preach my meeting. I will stay here. I will preach his meeting. It's a win-win. The Lord was not impressed with my idea. So I said to him, why am I going anyway? Now, a teenager said, God answers prayer three ways. Yes, no, and you've got to be kidding did you ever pray one of those that you're sure some angel is saying, what did he say? So I said, why am I going? And in a few moments, I heard the Holy Spirit say this, because you're so average. <laughs> and when you get there, I want you to tell them that. Right. You want me to tell them they have just brought a speaker in from the other side of the world, and he's average. And they said, yes, tell them that what they see while you're there is what they are going to see and experience in their churches and their ministries after you leave because it's not about you. It's about me. Now, when God told me I was average, at first I was a little put out. You know, God, I don't have to be the greatest God, but could you at least put me in the top 25% or something? You're average. I had a pastor's wife tell me once, you are not average. I said, listen, when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords says, I just checked out the universe, you're average. I said, it was the most liberating thing God ever said to me because I could quit performing. I didn't have to impress anybody. He already said, hey, I checked you out, dude. <laughs> You're average. But what God does with people who are just average, I, I must tell you this about that conference we went to preach. First two nights were terrible. Be glad you weren't there. 1,500 people under the tent. The first night, 35, 40 people got saved, but that meeting was so tight. The second night, about 35, 40 people got saved, and it was still tight. The third night was worse. The congregation sang one song terribly. And I am not stretching this. This is not evangelistically speaking. They brought the choir up. If I've ever heard a worse choir in my life, I don't remember it. So you have one congregational song, a choir that was worse, and then the guy gets up and says, we brought our speaker in from the other side of the world. We wanted to have plenty of time, and he's given me the service, and I am thinking, what am I going to do with this thing? So I'm walking to the point of thinking, God, what am I going to do with this? It's not ready. 
the Spirit of the Lord tends to speak to me pretty simply because when you're average, he has to do that. And he said, I want you to just have them stand and worship. That's not all that complicated. So I said, before I preach, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I said, you know, for a bird to fly, it takes two wings. I said, for this service to fly, it's going to take two wings. It's going to take the wing of the Word of God, and it's going to take the wing of worship. So would you stand with me, and can we lift our hearts before the Lord and worship? They tried. They worship for three minutes. It's going nowhere. And the Spirit of God said, I'm saying, Lord, what do I do now? And the Spirit of God said, stretch it. So I said, can we go one more minute? And somewhere in that next minute, my wife was sitting off on this side under that tent, and she said it was like a wind blew down the stairway into that tent, and it just erupted right there, just suddenly. And then back in that corner of the tent, and then over there, and then here, and then here. And and I stood there for the next 30 minutes with microphone in hand and just watched as it erupted over. And throughout that tent, people caught up in the presence of God. And then God said, now give the altar call. I explained to him I hadn't preached yet. That was just in case he had failed to notice that. And he said, give the altar call. I said, Lord, you know that the guy in charge said I was going to preach, and he's really hard to work with. He doesn't like Americans. I want to be submitted. Give the altar. You ever try to argue with God? So seeing I was losing the debate, I gave this altar call, and the missionary, I counted 600 people. The missionary counted 900 who ran to the altars to give their lives to Jesus. And then, and then I preached for a few minutes, and over 300 got baptized in the Holy Spirit that night at the altar. A graphic reminder again from the Lord to me, you can't, but I can And you see, what you want, what you desire for Decatur, what you desire for this region, is that God would send the fire. That there would be a fire from heaven that would come, as it did in the book of Acts in that church. And that God would send a fire that would be transformational in your life and transformational in the church and the city that you are in. Uh, very rapid. Let me share with you seven things. This will be a miracle to get this done in the next 10 minutes, but we'll work at it. To be a church on fire, you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. Matthew 3.11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals are not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and fire. Now, scholars have struggled those two words, and fire, because it's got to be more than enthusiasm. I've been in a lot of places that are enthusiastic, but it wasn't the fire of God. This has got to be more than the fire of excitement. It's got to be more than the fire of energy. It has to be more than emotional worship. But there is something that God is saying, I want to baptize you in such a way that you will carry fire in your spirit and in your life. If I were to make a prophetic declaration, I think I would say something like this. I believe that there are those who God would say to you that you're going to come to understand experientially what it's going to mean for you to carry the fire of God. We do know Acts chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4. There appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. He wants that for you. I was preaching in Vancouver, Canada. Given the invitation, people at the altar were praying with people like we will do in a few minutes. And I get to this lady and 
I heard myself say, I wasn't planning this. I had strategized this. It just kind of rose up inside. I, I heard myself say something like this. You're about to have an encounter with an anointing of the Holy Spirit that is going to change your life. Now, that's not particularly a profound thing to say, but it just rose inside of me, and I said that, and, and I'm standing in front of this dear lady, and she begins to tremble slightly. And then she begins to shake violently. And then she falls on the floor, speaking in tongues vociferously. And I decide at that point, she really doesn't need me. I'm watching her. I think, well, she and the Lord seem to be doing quite well. And so I moved on down the line. And ultimately, I had to slip out to go to the necessary room for a few moments. And, and so I missed the story. My wife had to share it with me later that the pastor had gotten this lady to her feet and said, you need to understand, folks, what's going on here. A member of the worship team, uh, but she had never been baptized in the Holy Spirit by the pastor's definition. She thought she had everything she needed. And she has said to her pastor, I don't need to speak in tongues because I'm already anointed. And she was a good worship leader. She did a great job that morning. But now she's speaking in tongues. It appeared to me that she and Jesus had a different conclusion about whether she needed to speak in tongues or not. Six weeks later, we went back through that church on a return trip back to the States. Uh, and the pastor said, my people are saying something has happened. There is a fire inside of that lady beyond anything she ever possessed before. The Lord wants you to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. Preaching in Finland, as I said, and, and I'm praying with a young lady one night, and she starts going, ho, whoo, hot, hot, ho, hot, hot. And then she starts speaking in tongues. And once again, I decide at that point, she really doesn't need me. And so a later member of the team said to her, what happened to you tonight? She said, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. In a few moments, there'll be an opportunity given for people to come to the front of this building, to the altar, in a time of response. Somebody in the church's ministry team is going to be coming to help pray for people. And, and if you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, it'd be a great opportunity for you to say to that individual, I would like to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I would like to speak in tongues, but I also want the fire of God to be inside of me. Number two. To be a church on fire is a petition to the Lord to presence himself and then for us to become a guardian of that presence. The fire of God consumes everything in our lives. We read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, and then 28 and 29, New King James, You have not come to the mountain that may be touched, that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Our God is a consuming fire. The Old Testament reference was the mountain where God had made his presence to come. He made it visible in the fire, the thunder, the cloud, the, the sound of the trumpets, the mountain beginning to shake. And this was what they would think of when God said, this is what my presence wants to come as a fire. As a consuming fire, he will consume everything in our life that is not of him. Important if we are to receive the kingdom. The invitation to God is to come, present yourself among us. Now I understand the word of God teaches he is omnipresent. My theology is correct. I understand out of Psalm 139 that there is no place that you can go that he is not already there. And I'm glad to know when we gather to gather in his name that the word of God promises me he is going to be there. But it's something altogether different when the omnipresence of God becomes the manifest, the revealed, tangible presence of God. And you realize the atmosphere 
Okay, what you were saying, uh, when I step on this campus, that boy said, there's something different on this campus. Why? Because there was something of the presence of God that you would pray through to that place. It is that presence of saying, God, we not only want you in our homes and I want you in my heart and my life, but we want you in our public gatherings that there would be that incredible sense that God himself has come into this place. I want you to see another aspect of being consumed. To be consumed, according to my dictionary, can absorb all means to absorb all of the attention and energy. The thesaurus says to absorb, preoccupy, engross, eat up, devour, obsess, grip, overwhelm, monopolize, enthrall, dominate. Fires tend to demand the attention of people. Some of you knew my mother who went to be with the Lord on Easter. When I was a kid growing up, my mother loved to chase fire trucks. She never did chase the ice truck. But when the fire alarm went off, we boys understood that the next event was we would be thrown into the back seat of the car. And she'd be off to see where the fire was at. There's something about fire that grabs people's attention. I want to come and presence myself as a consuming fire in your midst. It is, I believe, the greatest indicator of revival that I personally experienced. It's, I was preaching in New Zealand Remember the national executive team had come to the meetings one night. He spent the entire night on the floor. I don't ever remember praying for him. He just ended up spending the entire night on his face on the floor. At the close of the service, he said to the pastor, the only thing that I can tell you, sir, is that God himself has chosen to come into this place it was not unusual during the 20 weeks of those meetings where 800 people got saved for somebody to walk in the office during the week and say, what is it that's going on here? Because when I go by this place, I sense, I sense something, I feel something I don't feel anywhere else. Can you explain to me what it is that I am feeling? <laughs> I love the, the preacher that came one night. And after one night, he decided he'd seen everything he needed. <laughs> so uh, he goes home, and he calls the pastor the next day and says, uh, why are these meetings continuing? They went 20 weeks. He said, why are they continuing? He said, I was there. He said, your music is average. No, he said, your music is fair. He said, your music is fair. He was being kind. It wasn't that good. It was living proof that you didn't have to have great music for God to show up because it, he said, the preaching is average. Well, what do you expect if God sends you an average? He apologized so many times to me after that. But the pastor said, listen, it's not about the music. And it's not about the preaching. But something is happening at the altar. And when people are coming and the presence of God begins to invade them, there are transformations that are taking place in their lives. You need to come back and you need to come to the altar. So he came back and he came to the altar. And I didn't pray for him, but some little lady in the church, she was so straight, she made a ruler look crooked. She, she, she was still wearing the Pentecostal bun, the whole bit. And she lays hands on this guy. He comes to three rows back under the seats, has no idea how he got there. And he goes home and calls, he was the presbyter of his region. He calls every preacher under his, uh, under the, that he was responsible for and said, get to that meeting. Go to the altar and find this lady. <laughs> because there was something that he had encountered in the presence of God. I want that for you. To be a church on fire, you must become those who are being purified. And set aside by the fire of purification. In Malachi chapter number 3 and verse number 2. Who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For 
He is like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. While we must avoid legalism, we must understand the fire of God will always consume or burn sin out of our lives. It will purify. Was your mother like mine? When I was a kid, I'd occasionally get a splinter in my finger. And if I got a splinter in my finger, my mother seemed to feel that that required major surgery. And she would get the needle. Yeah, some of you have been there. She'd get the needle and she'd go to the stove and she'd turn one of those burners on and she'd stick that needle in that flame. Now, she said to me that she did that to purify the needle. I thought she just liked the smell of scorched flesh. <laughs> Mine. <laughs> but we understand there's something about fire that purifies. It's the staff pastor in a 19-week revival who said to me, we have never seen our people walking and living in this level of purity. It's the morning I walked into a church office in a 20-week revival in New Zealand. When I walked in, the staff said to me, the secretarial staff, last night we saw the greatest miracle we've ever seen in our lives. My mind is spinning. What happened last night? I'm trying to think of something that would qualify as the greatest miracle that somebody had ever seen. I couldn't think of anything. I walked down to the pastor's office and walked in. He said, you will always have an open pulpit in this church because last night I saw the greatest miracle I've ever seen in my life. As a pastor, obviously, I'm the only person who doesn't have a clue what God did last night. He said, you remember the little lady with the gray hair? Yeah, you know, she had lay on the floor so long we thought she had died. Honest, the pastor got down at one point and put his ear against her nose to see she was breathing. And very, very quietly he could hear this. Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus, I'm sorry. She had been into the church offices already that morning. She had a reputation. She was the principal, or had been, of a school in their community for discipline. She would put kids under a rug, and she would walk on top of the rug. She had a reputation as the meanest woman in the valley. They were afraid of her. In fact, what God did that night in her life in the years that followed. Guest speakers would say, what a wonderful thing it is to grow old gracefully in the presence of God. And they'd point to this dear lady and her husband and the church would choke because they knew that just up to a very short time before, she was the meanest, most cantankerous woman you'd ever want to meet. But when the fire of God the fire transformed everything inside of her. And she became one of the sweetest people that you would ever hope to meet. Number four, to be a church on fire, you must become carriers of the revival fire. The disciples on the road to Emmaus make this statement, did not our hearts burn within us? A fire that burns in your spirit that you sense. Isaiah 64, 1 through 3. Oh, that you would come down and rend the heavens. You would come down that the mountains might shake at your presence. As fire burns brushwood. As fire causes waters to boil. Make your name known to your adversaries. That the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things for which we did not look. You came down. The mountains shook at your presence. The fire that you carry is going to ignite dry wood. I, I, I read that verse. And I thought, Lord, why did you put that phrase in the middle of it? 
That verse makes sense without the phrase about the fire burning brushwood and the fire causing waters to boil. You could take that phrase out and it still makes sense. And I believe that the Lord wanted me to know that, well, he said, well, what happens when fire begins to contact wood? It changes the, the appearance of the wood. It changes. You see, fire changes surroundings. When the fire begins to cause the water to boil, it changes what the water is. When fire begins to light upon wood, it changes what the wood is. And when fire begins to light in your life, it begins to not only change you, but it begins to change the circumstances, begins to change those around you. You can walk into a room that is cold and you can light a fire in the fireplace. And it's not just that the room gets warmer, but the entire atmosphere of the room begins to change. Why? Because fire brings changes in the atmosphere. God wants you to carry fire that causes the atmosphere around you to be different. My wife and I were sitting at a cafe. It was travel day. It was like temperature's been the last few weeks. It was like 105 outside, and we were not going to reach our destination that day. And so we, I, I had cutoffs on, and I had a T-shirt on, and we're sitting for lunch, and the waitress brings us our food, and she sits it down, and she says, are you a preacher? It wasn't even a cool Christian T-shirt. It didn't say turn or burn, you know, nothing like that. It was, it was, it was just a T-shirt. And I said, uh, yeah. She said, I thought so. Because when I walked up to this table, I felt the presence of God. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, someday, someday if you'll let me, I want to do something inside of you that will not just be another believer who senses my presence, but that you will walk into places and atmospheres will begin to change. Why? Because you are carrying my presence. That the fire that you carry will begin to raise the spiritual temperature around you. Historically, Evan Roberts prayed Isaiah chapter 60 over, the, over his nation and, 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 asked, and it was that which was the foundation for the great Welsh revival. Pastor said to me in one revival, he said, Michael, you don't even understand what you are carrying right now. He said, the moment you don't have to lay hands on people. He said, all you have to do is just kind of get in their neighborhood at the altar, and there is something that you are carrying that you don't even know that you're carrying, and it's impacting their lives. Fire of God. Hearts cry, says, oh God, I want to carry that more, not just occasionally. But Lord, I want to walk with that fire that changes, not just churches I preach in, not just to have people say, you know, there's something when you got, no, I want to walk in. I want to walk into the pizza place after a Sunday night service and people begin to fall out of their chairs. I want to walk in and have them begin to say, sir, what is it that I must do to get right with God? I'm not speaking weird theories. Those are things that historically have happened in moves of God where people carried something of the presence of God that changed the atmosphere around them. God, I believe in the days ahead, wants to let you carry his fire experientially in such a way that others begin to come to you and say, can you explain to me what it is? It's, it's, the, it's the young lady whose church was in revival, pastor's daughter. And her friend said to her, I'm not even certain we like to be around you any longer. She said, what do you mean? She said, because you make us feel dirty. They were Christians. She hadn't said anything, but they said, you become so pure. You become so clean. There's just something around you now that we don't even know what to do with you. God, give us the fire. Let me begin to bring this thing in for a landing. To be a church on fire, you must become proclaimers of the pure word of God. 
Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back and I could not. In Jeremiah 23 and 29, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. I want to say to those of us in this room that had the incredible privilege, opportunity of whether it's standing in front of a class, whether it's leading a group, whether it's preaching from a pulpit, whether it's preaching on the streets, that God wants to put a fire inside of you that causes the Word of God to, to go into people's hearts in a way they cannot forget. I was preaching in Argentina on the streets. And it was one of those moments. We had a bunch of teenagers doing stuff, dances and stuff to get attention. And, and, and when, I, when I got up to preach, suddenly he came. Just, pew, there he was atmosphere changed. I didn't even try to preach. I just said this. You feel him. He just came to this corner. And I shared just a moment about giving their lives to Jesus. And then I literally went eyeball to eyeball with every person that I could catch their eye at that corner. And I challenged them to give their lives to Jesus and nobody responded. I mean, nobody. I'm like, I don't, I get this. You're, you're here, Lord. I felt your presence. But yet, three weeks later, I got a, an email from the missioner. I said, Michael, I got to tell you this. Because I was in that city last night. I was at our church in that city. He goes, and the pastor said, did you see those young people, about a dozen of them over there? He said, yeah. He said, they just started coming to the church. He said, they walked in and they said, are you the guys that put together that, that thing on the downtown? Yeah. They said, we never felt anything like that. We felt something we've never experienced in our lives. It had taken them 10 days to figure out what church you put it on. And they say, can you explain to us uh, what we felt that day on the street and the entire dozen young people had given their lives to Jesus Christ? Why? Because a tangible presence of God had come into a place. It's a guy that said to me one day, he said, you know, you don't even realize he said, there are moments when you're preaching in this revival, it's like there are arrows from the Lord that are coming out of your eyes and they hit us. And we can't escape. We would like to, but we can't. Why? Because there can be those moments that God puts a fire on you and on the communication of His Word and it goes deep into the heart of the individual that you are speaking to. Number six. As a church on fire, you may not be accepted by everyone. Luke chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus is speaking. I came to bring fire on the earth. I wish it were already set ablaze. I have a baptism to be baptized with. How it consumes me until it is finished. Do you think I came to bring peace? No. I tell you division. No, I like the thought of God's fire burning on the earth. But in the context of Luke 12, it's a division caused by Jesus. I have some friends who like a good fight. I had a lady in my church. I don't think she was happy unless she was fighting somebody. It was just who she was. I've always been on the side of, can I be bring people together? But here's the reality. Sometimes when God sends the fire into your life, people don't know what to do with you. And when God sends the fire to a church, some people don't know what to do with that church. And God sends a fire to a people and it becomes controversial. You weren't trying to become controversial, but the fire of God inside of you begins to change the temperature around you. And some people just don't know what to do with that. You see, over the years, I, I, I've been amazed because there are some things that, well, I mentioned a meeting of 800 people got saved, but there was one man in the church who did not like the meeting at all in any way, shape, or form. He, he heard that the press was coming to interview, so he called them. 
to give them a series of questions that they should ask because there were things he didn't like. I wanted to ask this guy, which one of the 800 people that gave their life to Jesus did you not want to see go to heaven? But there were things happening that he wasn't comfortable with. And sometimes when God sends the fire, it begins to expose things. And somebody say, oh, God, send the fire, please, to my neighbor. Because he sure needs cleaned up. God, send the fire to that person that sits down the road for me because, boy, they need it. God says, how about I will send the fire to where you sit? Because I need to do something inside. Will you give me permission to do that? I close with this. Linda, come to the keyboard. As a church on fire, you will be sheltered and protected by that presence. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5. For I says the Lord will be a wall of fire all around her. And I will be the glory in her midst. I don't know what the future holds. I have things I suspect. We may be coming into the greatest season of persecution and opposition that the church in the West has ever experienced. If that's what lies before us, I want you to know something. The fire of God will also become a wall of fire around you. There will be dramatic stories of God's incredible protection. Unusual things that He will do. And there will be stories of those that will go through the fire. And there will be some who go through the fire and be unscathed. And there will be some that in the midst of persecution, they may pay the ultimate price. God gave me a word for a pastor and wife one day. I, I tried to negotiate with God on this one. And I finally, I, I finally said, I think I heard God saying to me to ask you, are you willing to pay the ultimate price? They broke, began to weep, because just weeks before, the exact same word had been given to them about their potential future, that it may be the God that many of us will find ourselves. But he's also saying, but in the midst of that, my fire will be there. And you will discover, my wife and I am coming to an end. We were preaching in Vietnam. At that moment in time, Vietnam was a bit like mainland China. There, there was very, very little freedom, and we were in there, and every day they changed locations. They couldn't figure out where we were at, and, and they, would, they, would, they went a different way every day and, and to get to the places. It was, it was, I don't have time for the whole story, but to watch what God did in the midst of that and to hear the stories of God's work and my wife finally said to me one day, we were watching the most incredible bunch of joy. People the, who in the midst of the persecution, every person I was preaching to except one had been in prison for the gospel. And they told me, we're praying for that one to get arrested. Thanks, don't pray for me. <laughs> they said, because you said at this point in time in our lives, I said, they've, they've imprisoned us, they've beaten us, they've taken the stuff that we own. The only thing left is to kill us. Said, they've done everything else. The only thing they could do now is send us to heaven. And they were ready for that. There was such a joy. My wife said, you know what? If he did not put these friends in danger, I think I could stay here. Why? Because there was a fire in their lives. God wants that fire. In your life. Stand with me, please. How do I believe the Lord's calling us to respond? In a minute, and I have been too long, please forgive me. But in a moment, I'm going to ask those who would like to ask God to make you personally a flame, to leave your seat and come and just stand at the altar. I'm not as much concerned about the next. 60 seconds, so the God turns up and says, watch this, I'm happy. But I've discovered something. Sometimes God asks me questions, and then later he draws on my response. You see, my going overseas, I didn't plan that, but one day I said to the Lord, Lord, if there's some place 
any place on planet earth where you're planning for the dove to land and you could use an American evangelist, I'm a volunteer. I said, God, I can't go back to what it was. So if there's some place and a year later, year and a half later said, yep, I've got a place. I'm going to send you. And you're going to fit that place in a way that you'll have never understood. But he was waiting for me to give him permission. And I believe there's some in this room that God is saying to you, will you give me permission to set you on fire? Will you welcome my fire in your life, my presence? Will you welcome the fire of purification? Will you welcome the fire that changes the atmosphere around you? Will you allow me to put a fire on the words that you say at work, the words you say at school? Will you be willing to face the difficulties? I'll put my fire around you. It will protect you. And if you say, I think I could say yes to the Lord on that, and especially if you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And if you're in this auditorium and you've yet to give your life to Jesus, but you know that you should. I was going to start with that, but I said I don't have time to get into all of that. And you know I need to give my life to Jesus. I want you to come as others come. And I'm going to ask the altar workers if you would come first. Those on the prayer ministry team, altar workers, if you could come and just stand here at the front and get ready to turn around and face the people. I love to pray for people, but the one concession I've had to make to this heart situation was made me haven't quite reached the point of recovery yet that I can preach hard and then pray hard for people. So I'm, I'm really relying upon that. I'm asking God to put the fire in these friends. If you could say, Lord, I want fire. Whatever it means, you have been in the last few months. I've heard it since I came in, but I already knew it. That you've been experiencing something that's arising. My wife put it this way to church the other day. She said, there's a simmering going on in that church. It's a church that has known the fire, but right now there's a simmering. And you have the sense that it's about to boil over again. And there are some of you that there's a fire simmering. And God is saying, will you let me turn the heat up? Will you let me make it a full-blown fire in your life? That's what I'm calling for. I'm not asking for you to come to make me feel good. But if you say, God, I want fire in my life, whatever that means, send the fire. I'm a candidate. But I'm going to invite you right now. Slip out of your seat. Come and stand here at the front. One of these team members will pray for you. And then, listen, when, once people have come, there will be no official dismissal it's as normal. You can slip out as you need to slip out. You can linger at the altar as long as you want to linger. When you have to go, feel free to slip out. But could I invite us to come and give those who want to come a moment to come first before you leave? I know some may have appointments that you have no option. You have to be there. But you would say, Michael, I want to ask God to start a fire, fan the flame, in me. Now, Father, in Jesus' name, I know, Lord, time got away from us this morning. But, Father, right now in this auditorium, Father, at the pews here at the front, Lord, as friends begin to say to you, Lord, I am a candidate for the fire of God in my life. Would you hear them? Would you begin to ignite a fire inside of them today? This week, may they begin to experience a fire of God like they've never known in Jesus' name. Altars open. I welcome you to come and let these friends pray with you. When you have to leave, thank you for being here. You caught the announcements of the activities of the week. Take advantage of them. Be a part of them, especially the heaven's gates, hell's flames. Get, get on that. Be a part of that. Invite an unsafe friend to come and be a part of that with you. God bless you. Thank you for letting us be here. Uh, feel free to be dismissed as you need to. I will tell you this. If you're going to the door to escape the conviction and you knew you're supposed to come to the altar, running won't help.
because he'll go with you. And you just want to stand at your seat for a few moments and just say, Lord, here am I. Then please feel free to do that. God bless you. Once again, thank you for joining us today. I trust you received something from God's Word that not only you, but me, will apply to our life. You know, I will never ask you to do something that I know I should do too, and I want to worship Him, I want to praise Him, I want to live by His Word, and so that's what I would like for you to do also with me. Let me uh, ask you this question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you don't, you can do it today. Jesus died on the cross for you. All you have to do is say this prayer. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and help me to live for you. Amen. And he'll do it. I promise you he'll do it. Well, until we see you next week, Maranatha. God bless. We want to thank you for joining us today for Maranatha. Remember, a warm welcome always awaits you at Maranatha Assembly of God in Decatur. If we can help in any way, please don't hesitate to call or write. Until next week, here is wishing you God's best on behalf of the Maranatha family.